Thank you very much, Eve, for your kind introduction. And thank you to Brickworks for their <coughs> ongoing support of this uh, speaker series. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Double Talk number 34. We've been going for a little while now. Our first for Brisbane for 2018. For those of you who don't know, I'm Stephen Varity, uh, Sydney-based architect, educator, writer and critic. And since 2015, I've been engaged by Brickworks to curate and organise their Double Talk speaker series. An ongoing architecture speaker series showcasing the best architects from around the country in all six brickwork design studios in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Hobart and Perth. Double Talk is about explaining and understanding the making of architecture. Double Talk is also about generosity and the sharing of knowledge across our architecture profession and across the country. Once again, we bring together two architects from outside of Brisbane to talk to you about their work. We ask them to give some behind the scenes insights into their projects, about their brief, client, site, design process, construction process, and relationship to collaborators, as well as showing the completed works. Then, my co-moderator, Bob Nation and I, <laughs> Oops. <laughs> we'll engage in a conversation with our two speakers in the hope that we might reveal even more about their work and about how they think. As always, each speaker will present for 30 to 35 minutes and then we'll have about half an hour conversation in front of you, the audience. So settle in for an enlightening evening. If by chance you need to leave before we're finished, I ask that you do so as quietly as possible with respect to our speakers and the rest of the audience. And just a final reiteration, please turn off your phones. Thank you. On your seats, you'll have found a pamphlet to accompany tonight's talk. It contains information about tonight's speakers, along with links to the Brickworks website, Facebook page and events page, where you'll find more information about all the Double Talks, past, present and future. Tonight, we have Virginia Kerridge and Tony Chenchow, both from Sydney, who will show you two very different bodies of exceptional work. I've known both of them for most of their careers. Virginia and I crossed paths in Philip Cox's office before we both went off to set, set up our own practices. And Tony and I used to cross paths at various award ceremonies. <laughs> we'll begin tonight with Virginia. Virginia Kerridge studied architecture We'll get to that page. <laughs> Virginia Kerridge studied architecture at the University of New South Wales and established her studio in 1995. The practice became known for an exquisite catalogue of contemporary housing that crafted thoughtful relationships between interiors and landscapes. Virginia believes that her deep interest in art and art practice has led to an almost painterly approach to material, texture, colour and light and that these elements infuse the studio's projects in both new and existing buildings and across diverse housing and commercial projects. Over the years, Virginia Kerridge Architects has not only established itself as one of the significant design practices of contemporary housing in Sydney, but also for commercial and retail developments and hotel architecture. The Taylor Square Warehouse received an RAIA Merit Award and the 1995 President's Award for Recycled Buildings very early in her career. Since then, Virginia has received numerous awards from the Australian Institute of Architects and Houses Magazine, and the studio's work has been widely published locally and internationally. You may have seen her latest project, Main Beach Apartments on the Gold Coast, featured on the cover and inside a recent issue of Architecture Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Virginia Kerridge. Well, as Stephen was saying, my um, interest in architecture really started with an interest in art, and that was because of my upbringing. My mother studied art at the National Art School, which was then East Sydney Tech, with uh, quite a few artists that weren't at all well known then, but they were just her mates, uh, people like Tony Tuxon and Guy Boyd, she knew the Boyd family really well. So I think I was lucky in that my childhood was art was the sort of the centre of everything. So nothing 
that it really gave meaning to her life and I think that just got infused into me. So when I first studied architecture, I wasn't really all that interested in architecture. I just thought I'd give it a go. <laughs> I was much more interested in painting and sculpture and everything else. And I, you know, to a certain extent, I probably still am. But, but um, architect <laughs> architecture is something that I happen to be reasonably good at. And um, <laughs> anyway, that's sort of where I start to come from. <laughs> anyway, so I thought I'd start, introduce the talk with some, a view of s some of my good friend Shona Wilson's artwork, because I thought it was interesting to look at architecture as a way of intervening into landscape, sometimes it's cities, but it's always an intervention of some sort where you're hopefully adding something that's not going to take away from the environment, it's going to add something. And maybe what it's, what it's going to do is add something that makes you look at the environment in a different way. So these are just very simple exercises that she's done. Um, and she, she did a book called One a Day. And um, this is quite, quite beautiful and quite simple. And in some ways, it's kind of, it's nice to look at these and think of interventions in art architecture in a similar way because I think this is almost uh, and I sort of approach a lot of my work in this way it's kind of very almost I th think about tactility a lot and the way spaces smell and feel it's not always just about lines it's about the feeling of the space once you've created it and how how comfortable you are and um, sometimes then you know the way it makes you appreciate something else, so by placing this, I don't even know what they are, shells on, on this rock, it kind of makes you appreciate the solidity of the rock, the curvature of the rock, and, and really makes you, I mean, the way these twigs are just sitting on the water in such a delicate manner, really makes you appreciate the sort of, the water and, and um, just accentuates. The, the hoops in this image, accentuate the incredible um, structure of the tree and just the, also the landscape itself. It's, the, it's all heightened by, by the, um, the simple addition of, of some really thoughtful interventions. So in the same way, um, just looking at sort of mentors of... I think what's been really important in my career is, is travelling and one of the I mean, I to talk about this very briefly. It was just the Peter for the St. Benedict Chapel. It was very hard to find on Google Maps. But <laughs> it, it reminds me a little bit of those interventions of Shona's, except obviously in a lot more substantial way. But the way that it sits in the landscape and, you know, the inside of the... It, it's almost like being inside a shell. The way it sits in the landscape is um, quite remarkable. And also it may, really makes you appreciate the setting as well as appreciate the building as well. So that was just an introduction. So the first project that I wanted to talk about was an apartment building in Main Beach. So that's my first foray into architecture in Queensland. The client is Katie Page who owns the Magic Millions. So she wanted a base up on the Gold Coast. She, she, she grew up in Brisbane, I think. So she came to me and she said, I'm going to try you out in some other jobs, but ultimately I want you to design an apartment building for me in Main Beach. I bought this block of land and I want to build something very different for the area and I want, in doing this, I want to kind of sort of try and lift the area and, and take it up a notch. So that was kind of, in her, in her sort of vocabulary, that was kind of what she said. So just in terms of the way we started, we started doing... We started sort of with a team of people doing a, a forensic study of the whole main beach area and coming up with lots of sketches and lots of diagrams with how we wanted to reinvigorate the area and how we wanted to fulfil Katie's brief as well as um, really create something special. So as um, Malcolm Middleton pointed out in his urban design report, the overriding character of the main beach area is a multi-unit beachfront um, residential, with multi-unit beachfront residential structures which demonstrate very limited design um, consideration execution. So these uh, diagrams here 
sort of indicate how we, part of the analysis of the site, so that our site is here. So we, we know that there's a, a large area of tall buildings here and the rest of these buildings along here are, are all three storey. The, um, the council ruling was that you were only able to build a three storey building but Katie wanted to build higher than the three storey building. So in Malcolm's report, he, um, he came up with the idea of using a seven or eight storey building and um, thinking that that's a midway point between the very high buildings, which are predominantly sort of 30 storey in that area, and the lower scale, which is the two or three storey. Thinking that, that in doing so, we could build a building of great quality and also sort of add another dimension to that area and a scale which was a very human scale. So these, so these were some of the diagrams we prepared and sort of the notes, um, again, this is our, our site here. We had a sort of direct link to the beach down, down Beulah Lane, which was down the side of the, of the, of the um, block of land. And you can sort of see by the number of tall buildings around that the, the height that we were doing our building was almost quite small compared to a lot of the buildings that are there. It's almost like a median point between the low scale and high scale. So again, we did these lots of lots of these sketches showing this, the overall scales in the area, which sort of start to get taller and taller as you get to surface paradise. And um, these, are, these are part of the, the drawings that we submitted to council to show to sort of support our argument for having an eight-level building. So part of our um, approach to the site was to really enliven the sort of green areas around the building because we wanted not only to produce a building that seated comfortably in the area and um, added to the area, but we also wanted to really work on the landscape. We worked with Cardno in, on this and um, we wanted to almost do something that, that might encourage other people to do the same thing. Because I mean, the Gold Coast is such a sort of verdant area. It, was just, it just seems like such a shame that what would have been an amazing area has now become an area that's sort of, sort of built up and there's no greenery. But when you go to the areas that, that are still green, like Burley Heads National Park, it's absolutely beautiful. So you know, that sort of thinking was behind wanting to, to create this sort of green space around the building. So the building itself was divided into the bedroom areas at the front, which, was, which were the sort of protective enclosed areas, and the open living areas at the back. So the kind of idea behind the scheme was to create, create on three levels, to create this sort of veil around the building where you had decks set back all the way around and a series of sliding screens so that you could create outside living areas but that, all, that also really protected the inside because the harshness of the sun there is just so, so strong, particularly compared to, to Sydney. Um, so, and we also created these inlet decks which gave sort of shaded outside areas within the building but also allowed air penetration right to the inside of the building as well. So, and they also really helped sort of open up the, the building and make you feel like, less like you're in an apartment and more like you're in a house, more like you're connected with the outside. So we did a, a series of these sort of streetscape studies where we looked at how, how the building might feel from the street. It wasn't just about what was up on the upper levels, it was about how, how the pedestrian engaged with the building and how the, how the landscape was treated. Um, the, we came up with a sort of very... Um, oh, this is more about passive surveillance. Obviously, the, um, the building had to be... The, all the, you know, the, the, the decks also gave passive surveillance of the street. That's what this is sort of saying. So we came up with the idea of the front of the building reading like a collage. And so all the activities behind these various sort of screens and everything represented 
either a bedroom or, a, or an inlet deck and the whole, the whole sort of front facade became the sort of collage-like um, treatment. The, the materials used were um, sandy coloured concrete, which you know, obviously is not going to need any um, treatment at all. And we also, originally we were going to use copper, which later turned into zinc. When this drawing was done, it was going to be copper. So sort of areas of zinc. And um, we also used timber screens. And the timber we used was iron bark, which was pre-aged, because we sort of thought that nothing else was going to last in that environment. And they, the timber came from um, the old bridges that went from Kingaroy to Thebine. I think they were built in the late 1800s. So it was kind of nice to use something that came from Queensland and put it back into a, reuse it in a building in Queensland. And it was as tough as nails. Again, looking at, this is the view from Beulah Land down the side of the building. So again, the studies of building and the studies of the sort of deck areas overlooking these. This is the northern facade of the building. And lots of diagrams looking at how the airflow might work. One of the, um, it took quite a while to get approved. We had to go to a land environment court case in Brisbane, which went on for a week, which was actually a really interesting exercise. And it was the first time I'd, oh no, second time I'd have to stand up in court, but it was the scariest time. But also <laughs> the most enjoyable, because it was a really interesting process. I had been sort of dreading it, but I ended up really enjoying it and found it really, really interesting, particularly listening to the other, other consultants being cross-examined, not necessarily myself. Um, obviously, it got approved. We were told we had a 40% chance of winning to start with. So we went in there kind of not terribly confident, but very, very happy with the result. So one of the um, conditions of the approval was that we had to have a six-star rating. So it wasn't actually um, a six-star, it was designed as a six-star rating, so it wasn't actually all totally sort of um, set out the, and documented. So that, well, that was also kind of, that would have been quite an arduous thing. Anyway, so that's another reason that we <coughs> had to go th laboriously through um, all of the different sort of ways the building could be used without air conditioning. So again, looking at the diagrams, those little sort of inlet decks providing the cooling areas to the, to the inside of the building. And then looking at the sort of the, the um, starting to look at the three-dimensional side of the building, looking at how how the whole building worked in the street along with all the others. And again, looking at the landscape, the way the, the way the dune worked and the way the sort of, this is a common outside area. The sort of, you entered down the, down the side here, down opposite Beulah Lane, the sort of landscaped area, there's car parking underneath the building. And this is a typical floor plan, which, um, well, at least, no, this is actually the ground floor plan, sorry. This is the entry, entry and outside area, and then the sand dune. So actually, when we first started working on it, there was a terrible storm and half the sand got taken away, which the clients were freaked out about, but it's come back. <laughs> so again, more, more exhaustive sort of exercises in doing sort of 3D drawing, showing how the building was going to sit into the context of the surrounds. And also Malcolm had done these, Malcolm did these um, 3D drawings showing how the, the area might develop. So the areas in beige are what he was sort of thinking is a possibility of how the area could be developed. So these, the white ones were what was um, existing and this is our building here. So looking again at the area. And these were some of the um, models that we made initially looking at, at how the, uh, all the, the building was almost treated like a sculpture. So that was the way we sort of tend to design. We sort of tend to make a lot of models and try to really get a sense of the building. Before we get sort of too far into planning, we sort of try and work with the three dimensions. So you can sort of see how the front of the building's more solid, sort of bedroom areas and the living areas start to get more transparent. 
And even back then, in the very early days, we, we had these idea of these screens which floated on the outside of the building. And there were screens inside here as well which gave, gave privacy. So again, look, looking at these um, models really helped in forming the sort of um, the overall concept of the building and selling, selling the ideas to the client and also working with the, um, the idea of using it as a, the building as, as collage, almost as an, as an artwork. And this was the model that was built for the Land Environment Court case. So this sort of was sort of like a step up from our models, which were sort of very sort of rough and looked more like an artwork. These one, this was the model that we took into the court case and won the court case for us. So then this is the sort of finished, the finished work. This is the side overlooking the beach. So we were a little bit concerned that these, the veil-like um, screens were going to sort of block the view, but in fact, you, you can see through them very easily. At night, it almost becomes a bit like a lantern. And during the day, you can move these screens around so that where you're sitting, you're not sitting in the sort of vicious sun, but if you want to sit out there and, and, and look out over the beach, you can actually sit behind these screens and not get completely baked. Very different time of day. Someone said this looked like it's in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing how different it looks at different times of day. That's why I put in all these different the, the photos because just the way, yeah, it <coughs> looks like it's um. Mm -hmm. But again, the, the focus on the privacy from the street and the just the, being able to read what was going on inside the building, I think, was important um, for us anyway, and also to give some sort of uh, some sort of sense of identity to the to the building from the street. Again, looking, looking sort of up towards, this is up, up Beulah Lane, and I think already the landscape's pr probably grown quite a bit, although it is, the client rang me today and said everything's dying because the sun's so strong. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but these, the, the um, pre-aged timber screens really helped make, link it into the, into the beach and and really sort of have this sort of driftwoody feel. And again, looking at the, this is from the, from the front, so looking at the, again, looking at the way, the, it almost becomes a bit like an artwork when you sort of look at a section of it. And again, this is almost a bit cartoon-like, with sort of just the way that the building sort of works. We wanted to provide an identity of sort of permanence and elegance with our choice of materials. Because, because of the, um, the salt environment, it's just such, so, so radical. And again, the, the, the identity from the street is really formed by these sort of areas that, that these out, out, outside areas that, that give a strong connection with the street and also give some sense of what's going on inside the building but not, doesn't, don't reveal completely what's going on. And the, so this sort of shows how those front balconies work and how the screens work. And so even I think this is three metres wide, so it's not huge, but it's actually quite a decent size. So you can sort of sit out there with a table and chairs. And these screens move along, so you do get sort of some areas of view and some areas where you can sort of see through the, um, through the screens. But they, they do definitely good, give the building um, its own identity and as well as being very functional. So some of the private areas then can become more open by the use of these screens. The ones in this location here which face north are some of them fixed so the areas near bathroom areas are fixed so that you, you can sort of have doors open and walk around and um, feel like you're, bit, you're quite private inside. So again, this is looking out towards the street, looking towards Main Beach Parade from inside the building. And then again, looking back up Beulah Lane and inside some of the sort of um, living areas. So 
that was that one. And the next project I want to talk about was actually for the same client, but it was a um, it was a house in the country, and it was a, a um, on a horse stud in New South Wales. Amazing environment, incredible country. Um, a thousand race horses on this block of land. So when I first went there, I was completely blown away by the beauty of the country and by the, the size of these mountains. I mean, they're just enormous. And so it was quite daunting to, to think about designing something there. The, one of the most joyous things about this project was seeing the horses. Every time you went, you were sort of surrounded with horses so that the house was kind of sighted. So that it was right in the middle of all of the sort of working farm. This was an old stables that originally was going to be pulled down. We did talk the client into keeping it because we just wanted to keep some of the sort of history of the area. We were keeping the old cottages, but um, we, did, we really became attached to the horses, as you can see, because I'm just showing a lot of pictures of horses. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist it, though. So I just fell in love with them. <laughs> so the, these drawings show the size of the valley um, and the way the, the, the mountains are on either side. It's a bit hard to see in this drawing. But what we decided was, this is the main, the main house, the main house which was centred around two existing sandstone buildings, which had first been occupied by Captain Thunderbolt and his wife, Yellow Long. And they, they were quite historic cottages. They're sandstone cottages. So the little one was a... Um, a food store, and the main one was the cottage they lived in. And there was a, a creek called Widden Creek along, along here. So the idea was to, once you're there, I think it was just so hard to ignore the power of these mountains that we felt like the, the houses really had to be, follow the line of the valley and really open up on either side to um, just observe the mountains and, and really be connected with them. So you can sort of see again the, the scale of the buildings, absolutely tiny in comparison to the scale of the surroundings. So the way we sort of looked the, on the western side, the roofs sort of gently look, lift up and they're sort of designed so that you kind of get the whole view of the mountain. And on the eastern side, they're sort of a little bit more contemplative. So you can sort of see that here. These are the two, we designed some cottages for some vets as well sort of adjacent to the main house which was over here and um, this sort of shows the whole thing in relationship to the, the sheds that originally were on the property. This was the stable building I showed you before and this is another a shed where all the farm machinery and working was done. So it sort of turned into a designing a sort of little, little cluster of buildings and little street joining them all. So we worked with Jane Owen and she did all of the landscape work so it was great fun working with her. And um, this, this shows the main house and the way the, the house is wrapped around these cottages. So for a while, and because I do get quite a lot of jobs where I work with existing buildings, I've kind of, the way I approach it is, um, say for instance in this one, I approached it almost like we were grafting this building onto the old building because the client wanted, was very interested in having the building incorporated in the new building, the old building is incorporated in the new building. So it took quite a long time to come to a resolution but we were, we were happy with the way this worked. So we had this sort of long corridor that, that held everything together, the bedrooms in this location. Uh, garden areas that sort of broke up the, the form, living area, and then sort of main kind of living area here, and um, outside meshed in deck here and a meshed in deck here. So the, the building, because of the desire to connect with the mountains on either side, the building became quite a transparent building, which also sort of gave it a certain translucency and, and beauty and lightness that connected with some of the bush around. We used um, iron bark again, like we used in the last project. One of the reasons were there was a lot of iron barks in the area, and the other reason was that um, iron bark is highly resistant to termites, and there's a lot of termites in that area. 
the other thing, w there's a lot of wombats as well. So, <laughs> so the footings were all concrete because the wombats just pull all the buildings down that aren't concrete and they're <laughs> foundations. So this is how the building worked with the little standard stone cottages that were on the site. So they, they sort of became part of a, of a collection of buildings that sort of, the, the new ones obviously are very different to the old, but it kind of, they kind of tie in together. So this, the old pantry has become the new pantry and ties into the kitchen. So this is like the food store and the, and the pantry. And the old cottage has become the sort of very sort of cosy rooms with fireplaces that you can really retreat into when you, when you want to get out of the, the open areas. So it kind of sort of shows a bit more and that sort of shows the way the, these roofs work in terms of engaging with the mountains adjacent to it. And again, looking at the transparency and um, connection with the, the landscape connection with the mountains. So one of the client's ideas, was she, her brief really for the house was that she wanted an area to have a cup of tea in, in in the morning, which was this area here, and an area to have a wine in the evening. <laughs> So that was her main, her main sort of, that was what I can remember as being the most important thing in the whole house. So I think we, <laughs> this, area, this meshed in area here became the evening area because that's, you've got the western sun and it's quite a beautiful area to be in the evening. The sort of brass mesh sort of gives a sort of glimmering, the sort of glows and the timber sort of glows in the evening sun. So again, sort of giving, this, this sort of gives a sense of the sort of, the transparency and the, and the way the sun sort of works. So the materials are very rugged. Jane even found some old horse bones, which we thought was a bit risque, putting them in the garden. We didn't really want to tell them that they had horse bones in their garden, but <laughs> I think they didn't mind too much. They, 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 um, she found them on the property. So she was keen to use things that she found, so she went fossicking. Um, one of the interesting parts of doing this job was getting to know Peter Andrews, who's a bit of a local sort of urban, I mean, legend in the area who does a lot of work with regenerating um, land around there. And the, what he does, he's very eccentric. He, he's done a lot of work with the creek and he, his main idea is to grow a lot of weeds and to really diversify the, the, um, the different sorts of minerals in, in the area. He's sort of, there's willow trees there, he sort of cuts them down and and puts them across the creek, and the idea is that all the nutrients from the creek, instead of being lost down the creek, sort of uh, uh, taken out into the land around, and the nutrients go into the land and get absorbed into the land. And the proof's in the pudding, because their, their property looks, is the greenest property around. And it's just from these very, very simple techniques that don't cost anything, and this sort of madman's doing it all, but he's, it's actually working, and he's a you know, brilliant guy. So they sort of, he lives on their property, looks after their property. So again, the sort of, this is a sort of sense of being inside the building and the way the, the building, it, it, it really is enamoured. <laughs> well, I suppose I'm, I was enamoured with the landscape. They were enamoured with the landscape, that's why they're there. So the building really reflects that, that, that um, connection. And this is the more kind of, this is the eastern side where it's kind of, Internally, the house is also very robust. I mean, it's a country house. The materials are designed to last. And um, we did have a bit of a play with some rammed earth as well. Well, the, some earth from the local area that we used as part of the sort of rich sort of textures and, and the sort of, the use of the sort of red earth colors inside the, inside the, um, the house. And again, the sort of sense of tactility and um, that we enjoy in all the work we do was explored in different details, like sort of handles. We had an amazing sort of um, keyhole that you could sort of open up and look out, all done by a fabulous bespoke um, cabinet maker that we use a lot, who's great fun to work with. And these are some of the vets' houses. So the, these aren't quite as expensively finished, but they're, they've still got the same sensitivity in the lightness of the roofs and the sort of the general form. 
and the, the way they relate to the, the, the shapes of the roofs relate to the mountains around. And all of the... There's a platform that runs along, which is actually... Um, uh, this is the top level of the 100-year flood. And so that, that stone wall, which was designed by Jane, kind of takes care of the, the 100-year flood. And so the next um, scheme is a very tiny job, so I thought these other ones are quite large, so I'd show a tiny one. And this is a studio in Glebe. So it's an 1870s house designed by Edmund Roos, who was a famous architect in the 1870s in that area and designed quite a lot of the lovely houses around there. Um, what We didn't do an enormous amount to the existing house, but what we did was we cut very sort of sensitively into the old building and put these steel windows to show that everything new was kind of clearly, clearly distinguished from the old. Um, looking through here, yeah, the treatment of the inside of the house again there. Um, so this was a studio in the garden, which became an area that the client worked but also creates jewellery and also has jewellery openings and entertains quite a bit. So it, it was designed as sort of a collage of materials, it's like a double height cubic volume in the garden, which gave privacy to, on the other side of this is a big set of apartments which overlook her place. So aside from being a, a, a studio, it also acts as a, as a sort of a shield to the neighbour, being looked at by the neighbour. And the interesting thing is that it makes it a lot nicer to be outside now because before they didn't really go out in the garden much. But now they're always entertaining and um, you really do get a sense of privacy by this building being there. And once you're inside the studio, you're, you're in this quite nice enclosed space, but you also do get these long views into the tree adjacent and um, actually, I think Mark, Mark worked on this job. Mark, Mark's actually here. <laughs> I don't know if you ever saw the finished pictures. So yeah, so it's, it's in a marked contrast to the, to the old house. And was, was built extremely cheaply. A lot, like, you know, a fraction of the cost of the other projects that I just showed you. And it, yeah, as you can see, everything's built on the cheap, but it kind of works and it really makes the whole place, the rest of the place work as well. And then just, this is really just to show us a variety of work. This is another house in a Bronte, which overlooks the beach. And again, it's, it's mainly just looking at, um, again, this vocabulary of, the, vocabulary of textures that relate to the site. So, in this case, this, we, were, we were relating to the beach area, we used the bamboo screens, the sort of washed pebbles, and the slot views on the side. We, we um, increased the setback to the north, so there's northern sun throughout the house all day. And um, we used the sort of a lot of layering with, with different um, materials and um, sort of layers of shading over outside areas. So the ups, upstairs bedroom areas and this is the downstairs living area. And then the side of the building opens up to a little dipping pool. And the, the front entry, the, the house is way above the beach, so it's, I think there's about 30 steps up from the beach to the house. And then this enormous garden, very wild garden again by Jane Irwin in front of the house. And so, by the time you get up to these steps, you're almost sort of expiring because you've, you've, they've got, they're very old steps and there's no, I think it was built in the days where you didn't have to have a maximum of 18 steps. I think there's about 30 something steps with no break. Um, yeah, so this is the entry to the house. The house has a sort of slot so that each level relates to the other. So it's actually a house for a couple so they can always talk to each other. So you've got the uh, study up here and bedroom up here and anyone up here can sort of talk to someone in the kitchen rather than having to run down the stairs. And again, that, that sort of connection in the house to the downstairs. And the sense of light. The sense of light 
and the sense of tactility is always important in in um, in the, that's what I'm really interested in and interested in creating an environment that you sort of want to be in. And then this is the last project I'm going to show, which is the Lilyville Warehouse, and I've included it because it's, I think, what's one of the only ones that has bricks in it, <laughs> even though they're recycled. <laughs> <laughs> even though they're recycled. <laughs> and, they're, <laughs> and they're already there. <laughs> But actually what we did do was reveal them, because the, when we first started working on this project, it was, the, it was completely covered, it was completely unrecognisable from this, it was, it was covered in hideous blue render, mm -hmm. so you wouldn't even know that there were these nice bricks underneath it. So the first thing we did was forensically take off all the blue render and take up all the grey carpet. It had been, <laughs> in the 1980s it had been renovated and it was the Barlow Furniture Warehouse. And it was pretty bad. It was, um, <laughs> it was, the whole site was actually covered with building. So the client was um, the comedian Merrick Watts. So he, um, he interviewed lots of people and I, I don't actually even know why he chose me. It was, I sort of <laughs> he said he'd interviewed about six people. And I, I, I actually got his name wrong when I sent the, um, I, didn't know who, I didn't know who he was. I think he thought that I should know who he was, but I had no idea. <laughs> And then Lee and I were at, actually at the House and Country New South Wales one night and we said, oh, there's that guy, there's that guy that we met at that job. Oh, he's a comedian. <laughs> <Cause> <laughs> so I'd actually kind of guessed because I went back to work and I said, I've got no idea what this guy does, but I think he might be, he looks like some sort of actor or something. So I kind of, I kind of almost got there. Anyway, pardon? <laughs> so, so what we did, and getting back to the project, what we did was, <laughs> in, order <to> make, <laughs> in order to make it work, we, we um, created these, we took out half the building on this upper level and we created this sort of like open area and we created these sort of garden areas. This was the small one down the side of the house. Oh no, that was the big one, it looks small there. And an outside area, there's a pool hidden in the court end steel box here. The sort of, the, there was a big open plan living area on this level and all the bedrooms were downstairs. So, the, be, the downstairs was the, obviously the darkest area. But it's some, somehow, the garden just really brought it all to life. And instead of taking these down, we kept the, we kept the um, trusses as a memory of the old house so that you still had a a very good sense of what was there originally. And we decided that what we would do is, all the new elements, we would use recycled materials. So we'd try and use recycled materials in the whole place. So, this was the smaller. So it came together with two, two areas cut as incisions. So this was a smaller area, which was a sort of um, fern, fern garden. And the other side was the sort of main sort of lung of the house really. So this is the, coming into the entry. So using very sort of rough materials, this was sort of just black steel. And again, the, the walls which had been pulled back. This was the cheapest plywood we could find because we, we were, of course we were sort of getting over budget. So we, we just tried to get the cheapest of everything. And this was the kid's bathroom. We, these were like <laughs> $20 meter tiles. And um, yeah, again, using, using, being as economical as we could and trying to use, use everything on site that we could as well. We used um, reinforcing mesh as a sort of balustrade in the stair. And the kids playing. And it seemed to work. There's a big play area here and opened up into the garden. And it really seems to work well as a family house, which would, I don't think I would have believed when I saw the original place because it was looked a bit like a jail or something. And um, so this was the overall view from the upper, the upper level, from the bedroom level on the top level. And um, yeah, so that's, I think, the last, the last slide of that. So I haven't really followed any of the notes or said anything as I was going to say. <laughs> But um, this, I hope this gives a, a bit of an idea and a bit of an insight into the way we work. 
I think that was it. So thank you.